I'm here with Emily. Emily's been married to Landon for 10 years and has two children, a girl age six and a boy age two. So I have a lot that I want to talk to you about today. First, I want to start with uh, your daughter, though, who has diabetes, mm -hmm. um, type one diabetes. So uh, you have this really cool phrase, kid first, diabetes second. Um, I want to hear more about that in just a second. But first, can you just give me a dose of re reality? How does diabetes type one affect your life? your daily life? How does that change things? Um, okay, so I actually, it affects everything. No matter how um, used to it we are now. So she was, she was diagnosed three years ago. Um, and so it really is a part of our everyday life. But we joke that it is our third child um, because there's just so much involved, so much planning. Anytime we go anywhere, anytime we send her out the door, every time we tuck her into bed at night, multiple times through the night. Um, diabetes is just like another member of our family. I described it once in a blog post. I said, you know, it sits behind us in church. It is present in our family pictures. It accompanies us on family vacations. It is at every, you know, play group, play date, school day. It is just, it's just another member of the family. Diabetes is just it's always present. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. So, so tell me about kid first, diabetes second. If diabetes is always present, what does that mean? Okay. So in order to really um, dive into why I'm passionate about that phrase, and I didn't coin that phrase. Yeah. Um, it came from a book that I read when, um, when my daughter was first diagnosed. And um, it became our motto. We just, I just loved it. And I really resonated with that idea that my daughter was still a kid and her disease, her, you know, her chronic disease, it would define her. It really would. There's so much about her that is made up because of the challenges and the trials that she goes through. But ultimately, you know, when she was diagnosed, she was still a three-year-old little girl. And that was what was most important. So when she was first diagnosed, and she was so sick that we really had to eliminate everything from her diet and essentially start over by introducing things one by one to see how her body would respond. And that was traumatic. Um, Three-year-olds are already really picky. And then we took everything away that kids really like to eat. Um, snacky foods are what kids gravitate towards and they are the highest in carbs. And so we had to, we went through a really rough period where we had pretty much eliminated everything that she was used to eating. Um, and so at that time when she was first diagnosed, it was really hard for our family. We all had to go through this whole mindset shift about food and then within um, a year, she got her first insulin pump, which made dosing for carbohydrates so much easier. We weren't doing shots anymore. And so that really was the, the turning point of her gaining some independence of her diabetes. And the pump made it so that we could dose for smaller amounts than we could with the insulin um, shots. And that gave her even more food freedom. And then we got her continuous glucose monitor, which gives us a continuous reading every five minutes, even when she's at school, of what her blood sugar value is. And then with that, we were able to give her even more independence. And we were able to really track how her body was responding to different foods. And we were able to finally integrate pretty much everything back into her diet. But all through all of that, I feel like um, she had to be a kid first. So at a birthday party, um, I cringe when I think about what birthday cake is gonna do to her sugars. And I can see it on the Dexcom, what it's going to do to her. It's going to cause a spike, it's going to cause a rise. But she's a kid first and kids at birthday parties, they really like cake and ice cream. And ultimately, um, we needed to still allow her to have a childhood. 
So we have set up boundaries to keep her safe within that, um, that realm of allowing her to still be a child and to still experience things. So when, when we go to a birthday party, um, we have a standard family rule that we have one treat there and we, we, we bring one treat home for later because usually birthday parties, there's multiple treats to choose from and that can be really overwhelming. This really um, has allowed us to maintain that sense of childhood. Um, when she was first diagnosed, we had a church Christmas party and this was when she was first diagnosed. So we were not eating any carbs at that point. Um, really like we were being really minimal with our carbohydrate counts because we were trying to heal her body. Um, and I had found out the menu ahead of time, which is something that I, I still do, um, so that we can prepare her for what choices she might make when we get there. Um, and I, I'll never forget my sweet little three-year-old. We got there, we were prepared. We knew that they were going to have cupcakes for dessert, but we didn't know that there was going to be cookie decorating and there was going to be like all these other things. And it just was so overwhelming. We had no idea how to dose for a lot of these things. We were not practiced yet in dosing for children who graze. Um, most children do graze, but we didn't know how to dose for that yet. And um, I'll never forget, I took her out in the hallway because she was just sobbing. And she said, Mom, I'm not trying to be naughty. I just want to eat a cupcake. And my husband and I, we both broke into tears and we ended up just leaving the party. And it was when we were leaving the party that I looked at my husband and I said, there has got to be a better way. Um, we have got to find a way to still cultivate her childhood and, and keep her safe. And so that's where we started to develop our rules of moderation where, um, we still try things, we still enjoy things, um, but we keep her safe. Oh, that sounds so incredible that, I mean, there's so much buzz right now about having your children have a positive relationship with food. Yes, I would imagine absolutely. so hard for a kid with type one diabetes, but, um, but it sounds like you guys have found a really healthy way to, to be training for that. That's really cool. We saw in our daughter that she was just denying all food. She wasn't eating anything anymore. Um, she also had lost all self-esteem and confidence in making food choices. Um, church parties, birthday parties completely overwhelmed her um, to the point where she didn't even want to go to birthday parties, which what little girl doesn't want to go to a birthday party. And so we knew that we needed to adjust and adapt a mindset of everything in moderation and not cutting things out completely. Um, she started to feel the need to sneak food, which is really unsafe for her. And so we wanted her to not feel like anything was off limits. And as soon as we talked about that, she stopped sneaking food because she knew she could have it. Um, there's just a time and a place for it. We will ask her, um, okay, what is your body telling you? What, what do your sugars feel like right now? We try to never say, oh, your sugars are good or oh, your sugars are bad um, because she internalizes that as that she is good or bad. We try to really view her numbers as just a tool. Um, for knowing how much insulin we need to give her. So we'll say, you know, what are your sugars telling you right now? How do you feel? Um, what is your hunger scale? Let's do a tummy check. Is your tummy really hungry or is it just a little bit hungry? Um, to try to like really channel in how these foods are making her respond. And our hope is that then when she's an adult and she moves away to college, um, all the food choices out there won't overwhelm her because she's already been introduced to them in a moderate way. You know, with type one and type two, um, 
just diabetes in general, there tends to be a lot of stigma and a lot of judgment. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering um, what your experience has been. Has there been a lot of judgment from other parents? So unfortunately, we have met a lot of misconceived um, judgments. Um, when she was first diagnosed, I had an adult at her school say to me, man, I wish that you hadn't, or I bet that you wish you hadn't fed her so many treats. And the diagnosis was so new at that point that it just crushed me. Um, I knew from a medical education like standpoint, um, and I also knew from how we had been educated in the hospital that there was absolutely nothing that we could have done to prevent my daughter from developing it. But at the time, that really crushed me. And I think what crushed me more was knowing that there would be people in my daughter's life that would say things like that to her. Um, so we have battled that head on by raising as much awareness as possible. A lot of times, it is really good-natured people that are just trying to help me keep her safe, but they just don't understand. And so then they end up crushing her spirits when they say like, oh, no, 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 don't eat the popcorn. Um, when we have popcorn at home all the time. Um, so uh, my daughter is actually getting really good at providing her own education. She will say, no, I can have that. I just need to check with my mom on the carb counts or I'm gonna wait until I get home to eat that treat so that my mom and I can look up the carb count. So she's getting very good at advocating for herself. And we feel like this is still the best way for her in hopes that as she grows, she can make these choices on her own. Wow. Um, to kind of tie this up with a ribbon, what do you wish people knew about living with a child or being a child with a chronic disease? Um, it can be extremely isolating. My child handles it effortlessly. Um, she does everything without complaining. Um, she counts her own carbs. She administers her own insulin. She, she really is super independent. Um, that I think a lot of times even the adults around her forget that she has, um, this disease that she lives with all the time. It's always in the back of her mind, just like it's in the back of my mind and my husband's mind. And a few weeks ago at school, another child offered her a snack and without thinking, she just started eating it. And the adult who was in charge of keeping her safe overreacted. She, she panicked, which I get, like I've done that before too. Um, but it, it crushed my daughter. Um, and she cried the whole way home from school about how much she hated diabetes and she wished she didn't have it. And basically what it boiled down to is she is tired. She's tired of having to think about everything that goes into her mouth and tired about having to advocate for herself and wanting to just pick up a cracker and eat it and not have to figure out the carb counts. And, um, I think that if I could raise awareness to anyone with a child with a chronic disease or anyone with a child with type one is that I hear you and I get it. And it's exhausting. It is, it is exhausting. You know, we haven't slept through the night since she was three because we have to check her numbers through the night. Um, but as exhausted as we are, I can't even fathom how exhausted her little heart and mind are, no matter how effortlessly she tries to handle it. And I think most kiddos with chronic illness are that way. They are just trying to be normal kids, but they always will be not quite because they have to, they have to navigate this on their own as much as we try to help them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. What an incredible kid you have. That's really awesome. She is very incredible. Emily, you have chosen to be a, uh, a working mom. You um, have been a stay-at-home mom in the past. You currently uh, are a nurse in a hospital. Um, you also run a blog and you write for the Corpus Christi Moms blog and you run your Instagram account. You just have a lot of irons in the fire and a lot of things going on. Um, 
Uh, give me a logistical breakdown. Um, you're juggling a lot of deadlines and responsibilities, but you're obviously still very present for your family. How do you do that? Um, so of course you would ask me this this week. This week was like hot mess express at our house, <laughs> but ideally <laughs> this is what we do. Um, I am a registered nurse and I chose to work night shift, um, because I felt like it allowed me to not miss out on quite as much with my family. I'm very blessed in that I only need to work part-time, which typically looks just like two shifts a week. Um, sometimes I throw in a third if my husband is more available that week, um, and we just use that as fun play money. Um, I did not need to return to work, um, which takes a lot of pressure off of me because I know that if our family dynamics really couldn't handle me being away from the home, I could take a break. Um, but I worked really hard for my degree <laughs> and I didn't want to waste it. And for a long time, I, I had heard all these people say, you just need to find the balance. You just, you'll find the balance. And that is a deceiving word. I, I don't think that there is balance mm -hmm. because if you're doing one thing, something else has to give. So I, for example, I was so excited to talk to you today um, and to share these things that I'm passionate about. But while I'm sitting here talking to you, my dishes are not done. My laundry needs switched. Um, <laughs> my groceries need put away. Um, so you get what I'm saying? Something had to give. So actually I was listening to the book, Girl Stop Apologizing from Rachel Hollis and something she said in there just resonated so deeply. She said, it's not about balance. It's about being centered. Um, it's about being centered in who you are and what you feel is important. And as soon as I heard that, this need to find balance just lifted off of my chest and I realized that that is exactly right. When I go to work, I am Emily, the registered nurse, and I love it. I love taking care of people. I love, um, I love being able to lift some of those burdens, but I also can't be a, like the 100% present mom if I'm at work. And, and that's okay because my kids are home with my husband who loves them dearly. He, he does everything that I can do, um, if not better than me. And so when I'm at work, I'm at work. When I'm at home, I'm at home. And I am blessed that I have a job that typically allows me to leave work at work and be home at home. Um, other jobs, it's harder to find that divide. Um, when it comes to blogging, I'm still working on finding my divide with that. Um, I used to feel really guilty about carving out times of my day or times of my week to work on that passion project um, because it is kind of an extra passion project for me. Um, but what I've found is that in that whole line of being centered, you have to be really intentional with your time. So if I have arranged for my little boy to be at daycare for a certain period of time, and then while he's there, I need to be intentional with that time so that when they're home, when both my kids are home at the end of the day, I can be intentional with that time. Okay, so Backyard Adventures is your blog as well as your Instagram handle. Um, yes. Tell me first, quickly, what, uh, what's your mission at Backyard Adventures? Okay, so um, Backyard Adventures started about a year ago. Um, I was feeling so overwhelmed by my Instagram feed and all of these people that were going on all of these grand adventures. Um, I had just watched my, my sweet sister-in-law and my brother-in-law go on a cruise and I was like, really? Like, we're just stuck here in this little apartment and we were working towards you know, saving to buy a house, but we're paying off student loans. I wasn't working yet at that point. Um, I had this new baby 
And I just was in such a funk and, and comparing my family life to all these other beautiful families. And I decided to take a social media fast for Lent. So for a whole six weeks, I was off of social media. And it was during that time that I really found this passion project, which was encouraging and inspiring families to adventure right where they are. A lot of times we are so focused on our next big thing that we forget that there's adventure everywhere around us. So it started out with just um, blogging about our family's adventures here in South Texas, which is where we are. Um, and then it kind of has catapulted into showcasing how families all over are adventuring in their own backyards. Hmm. That's cool. Oh, I love hearing about this. Um, okay. Last question is a two-parter. Um, okay. how do you prepare these adventures to be as successful as possible? And what does success look like on a family adventure? Okay. Um, you have to remember that even, uh, unfortunate or bad memory is still a memory. Yeah. Um, it's still, it's going to be how you react to it. So I'll just tell a little story. Last summer, um, Backyard Adventures was just starting and I had to really stop myself from being like, okay, now I have this Instagram feed. So I have to make these adventures like look appealing to other people. Yeah. So my husband had a meeting down in Corpus Christi, which is about a 45 minute drive for us. And so I thought, well, we'll tag along, but he needed the car. And so I kind of had researched some things that he could drop us off at a central location and we could do several different things. Well, we got down there and it was really hot because it's South Texas. And I was walking. I had my baby in the stroller and my six year old with me. And we took a wrong turn. And if I had turned right, there was a park and the marina and all the boats. There was ice cream. There was like all these things. <laughs> but I took a left and we walked for quite a while and there was nothing. Like we couldn't find the beach access that we had wanted to. We couldn't find the ice cream we wanted to. It was like a disaster. The kids were hot. I was worried about my daughter's blood sugars dropping. Like it was a disaster. And um, Landon came back to pick us up and I just like broke into tears. And I was like, it was like the perfect day of summer vacation. And I ruined it. Like we wasted this whole day. And Landon was like, wait a minute. Like you were still together with your kids. We did end up finding ice cream. It was fine. Yes. If you had turned to the right, there would have been a thousand more things to do, but you still got to walk along like the beach. You, like we couldn't get down to the beach, but we still got to walk along it. It was still a beautiful day. And yeah, it wasn't the best memory, but my daughter still talks about it. Like, mom, do you remember that day where we went down to Corpus and we like just walked around? <laughs> and I'm like, do I wish that we had made other memories that day? Yes, but memories were still made. Well, Emily, thank you so much for chatting with me about some of these things. This is so fun. Um, are you ready for a speed round? Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to be speedy. <laughs> it's that's just the term. You don't have to. Okay. Do okay. Um, Emily, what's your favorite sound? My favorite sound is my kids laughing together. It's a great answer. What's your least favorite sound? Call lights going off. Oh yeah. What's your favorite word? Um, I asked my husband and he says it's legit. I say legit too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Child of the 90s. I think we all do that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. What do you know? I know that every mom is just doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have. Amen. <laughs> learn. What do I want to learn? I want to learn how to decorate cakes. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> um, what scares you? Um, what scares me is running out of insulin. <laughs> yeah, that's valid. Oh my gosh. Um, tell me about a mom you admire. 
I admire, I think I admire my mom. Um, a lot of times where I, I pull parenting wisdom comes from not so much talking to her, but remembering instances and how she reacted when we were little. Mm, that's cool. Those great observational parenting moments. Yes. Like, what are you good at? I am good at making friends. <laughs> I am good at dancing in the rain. And I am good at pushing back bedtime if it means we can have fun together. <laughs> oh, that's a great thing to be good at. I am not good at that. <laughs> it gets to be bedtime and I am done. Done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. This is way fun. No, I'm excited. Thank you.